I translate AI not as artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence or alternative. The exciting thing is AI intelligence is very different from human. And that's great because we want something new. We already have seen that AI and human together is better at identifying cancer in uh, in scans than each one individually. There, there's a human which kicks off the process, but after that, it's the the data which changes the co code. It reparameterizes itself, changes and things. But an AI can respond on the fly to the things that you're doing and create the music to, to, to be in tune kind of <laughs> literally with, with how you're playing. And the exciting thing for me is we have this prospect of uh, an enrichment of our experience and, and, and I think doctors will really benefit going forward from that combination. You know, I think we're already uh, able to do this. I, I had a woman from MIT Media Labs um, who came and gave a talk in Oxford, a really interesting sheet, uh, was analyzing whether an AI could detect a false smile in a human. So sometimes you're talking to somebody, they're smiling away, but actually they're really uncomfortable. Uh, it turned out that the AI was much better at understanding when a smile was false than we humans. It was picking up the key indicators um, of, of so already it's empathizing uh, more with the person it's uh, engaging with. And this, she realized, was going to be very useful, for example, for autistic children who find it very hard to, to read the mind of the other. And so if an AI was able to be sort of loaded up into um, uh, augmented reality glasses, might help the autistic kid to understand the emotional state of the person they're talking to, uh, who seemed to be smiling, but actually is uncomfortable. I think we need to get away from this narrative uh, as if it's some sort of competition between um, AI and humans. Um, that, that this is actually, AI will be a fantastic tool for a journalist to, to kind of uh, do the work that perhaps they don't enjoy so much. For example, um, you know, you mentioned uh, finance and business. Uh, a, a lot of uh, the information is written in uh, kind of r reports with numbers and things like that. What AI is being very good at is is actually putting the information that's hidden inside there, studying, understanding the patterns and putting it into natural language such that somebody doesn't have the facilities that I have to read um, uh, numbers and see the message that is inside there, is able to act as an interpreter of the digital world, the world of numbers, and actually help somebody with natural language to understand what's going on. We're already seeing, of course, um, uh, articles being written by AI. Or, uh, and for example, in uh, election time, very often if you're interested in your particular constituency, you don't want 600 journalists working on each constituency telling you, AI can tell quite a convincing story of what happened to this particular election this year compared to four years ago. The other very interesting place I've seen journalism, uh, AI journalism used is um, one of the things many people do around the world is fantasy football. They choose uh, 11 players and they create their own team and according to how the players do that weekend, uh, you score points. They've developed an AI which can produce a football report for your particular team. Now there are millions of fantasy football teams, so you could never have journalists, human journalists writing that, you wouldn't want them to. But this AI produces for each a bespoke report for every single uh, team, which I think is uh, very, very exciting. But I think you're right, there is a, a challenge of um, how does an AI interpret an embodied experience of a crowd or being at a concert or something like that. And so this is why you want a collaboration. My message going forward is that we need to be a bit more optimistic. It's about AI being a new tool for helping us to do things. So um, maybe AI will detect things about a concert that no individual could because of their position, in, but they'd be able to take a more global look. So, But combined, that's much more exciting to have, have both. Uh, Marcus, did you want to share with them the Harry Potter story? <laughs> Um, well, uh, uh, Sanjoy uh, alluded to the fact that AI seems to have difficulty with writing in a kind of long-term way. So it, it's quite good at producing short-term journalistic pieces, you know, a couple of paragraphs which make some sort of sense. But but what it doesn't isn't able to do is sort of uh, build a long-lasting narrative. So it sort of loses the plot. It can't understand what it's set up and, and, and the implications. So um, there was a, 
uh, a group of coders in America called they're called Botnik. They're quite fun to look up. They're different projects, but they're big Harry Potter fans, um, and they uh, they were really disappointed. There are only seven volumes of Harry Potter. They wanted more, and so they got um, the uh, a piece of AI to to take all of J.K. Rowling's previous work, learn her style of writing, the kind of themes involved, and then it started to produce an eighth volume. It was called uh, Harry Potter and What Looks Like a Large Pile of Ash. Kind of strange title, but uh, intriguing. Um, and, and it started off quite well, um, uh, if I can remember how it goes. It was sort of magic. It was uh, something that Harry thought of, or Harry Potter thought was very good or something. Um, so it already understood that magic was an important theme in this. And then it goes on to describe the rain kind of lashing down on, on Harry as he walked towards leathery, the castle. Leathery, leathery rain. Calls it leathery sheets of rain. Now, that, I think, is a very creative kind of way of describing rain that the AI came up with. I, I've never heard anyone call rain leathery. So it, it was already coming up with some quite interesting things. It had understood the major themes. But after that, it sort of started to lose the, the plot, quite literally. And it had sort of, it says, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. It's like, where does that come from? Uh, 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 and he started eating Hermione's family. And Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. And, and you realize, OK, th this has still got a long way to go before it is, you know, we get a whole volume of Harry Potter. But you know, things are advancing very quickly. There's a new text generation algorithm called GPT-3, created by OpenAI. And I've already done a review of a novel that was co-written between this piece of AI and a human. And they basically bounce stories uh, to and fro from each other. And the AI is making just such, such strange suggestions that it's pushing the human into new areas and ideas that they wouldn't have gone to without the stimulation from the AI. And, and for me, that's the really exciting thing. It's kind of kicking us out of our mechanistic ways of thinking. I think that humans tend to behave too much like machines. We repeat behaviors. Something that worked, we do it again and again. We need something to kind of that catalyst to make us think in a new way. What I'm seeing is that AI is a very powerful tool for a creative to make suggestions of new things uh, to think about. What I found uh, when I've done research on uh, things like consciousness is that you can actually shift somebody's consciousness provided you kind of attack two of their senses. So if you just produce a visual world, I don't think you'll make somebody feel like they're somebody else. But if you actually add to that perhaps sound, sense, touch, you can actually transport somebody to somewhere else. I mean, there are some very classic experiments where you can start to identify with a false hand, but it needs to be a combination of the visual and somebody stroking your hand and you see it on the false hand and you start to identify with that hand. So, so I actually do think in 30 years time, there might be the prospect of, of us uh, putting on some sort of suit, it's stimulating a mul multiple sensory uh, experience that would trick our consciousness into to making us feel like we are in the, the Maldives. Um, but, you know, again, we have something unique, which is our embodiment. And, and that, so th that is very important part of our experience of the world. I mean, that's what uh, Kant said, you know, we only know the world through our senses. Then we use some analytic skills to extend those to see something beyond our sensual world. But, um, you know, that, that's, that's where we start. And, and, you know, here today, it's about the smells, the sounds of the birds in the background, the, the heat, the feeling, uh, and the closeness of our embodiment is, is so important to our engagement. That's the really fascinating thing. So we managed to understand that we can create code such that the code is making those decisions. So as it encounters more data, um, and this is a really interesting kind of message going forward for education because it changes its code whenever it gets something wrong. If it's got some sort of, um, if it's trying to identify what's in an image and it gets something wrong, it rewrites more code to help it to get that right the next time. So, so what's really fascinating is that there, there's a human which kicks off the process, but after that, it's the the data which changes the code, it reparameterizes itself, changes and things. And that's why something very exciting, because we'll get new things out of it that weren't put in by the human. And that's why I think we're seeing true kind of AI creativity. But it also means there's a danger there because we start to lose uh, track of, of how the AI is making its decisions. And I think this is why we 
uh, one of the big things we'll need going forward is is uh, real deep digital literacy in um, the next generation because they are going to need to to tell when code is making bad decisions, when it's actually pushing and pulling us around in the wrong direction, when somebody has actually uh, taken control, you know, ca the, the dangers of what happened with Cambridge Analytica, um, that, you know, we are so malleable, as um, Daniel Kahneman wrote in his book, Th Thinking Fast and Slow, it just reveals just how easily we can be uh, misled and uh, how easily we latch on to uh, <laughs> the wrong idea, just from a little seed that's dropped in there. And, and once somebody understands that, they, you know, that's why I think we, we need tools to be able to question what the AI is doing and make sure that it is empathetic towards humanity, isn't on our side and isn't um, sort of pushing and pulling us around in the direction we don't want to go. Give them the, uh, the, the example of the coding of the game that we talked about yesterday. Yeah, so um, uh, for me, the first example of computer creativity happened in the context of a piece of software that was created to play the game of Go. Um, this happened a few years ago. You might remember the news story um, when a Korean player played this al algorithm and Previously, no code got anywhere near even an amateur level. It's such a complex game to play. But the reason there was a kind of phase change is that um, this piece of code was basically taught the rules of the game, but then took all examples of human games that had been played up to that point and analyzed what the patterns were that uh, made one side win over another, started to kind of uh, um, weight those moves against other moves which seemed to be uh, losing the player of the game. So gradually Actually, so what's, what a human had done was to create an environment where then the code can, each time it plays a game, it, it can change parameters, numbers in that code to wait. Okay, in this situation, more likely you should do this from what I've learned from that last game. And this uh, piece of code... Uh, it analyzed all human games, ran out of those, but then it started generating synthetic games. So it played itself, essentially. And then it could, you know, each version of itself that it changed, it would, uh, you know, if it won, then it, that one would be reinforced against the other one, which should be downgraded. Um, so I think the exciting thing is the ability of humans to write uh, kind of a meta code for code to, to write itself. And, and that's... Uh, so after you've done that, you can just release the code on data. And as you say, you need lots of data. That's one of the, the key things, it, which is why, you know, maybe the likes of Rembrandt uh, and Mozart are protected because they're, you know, the, the great works of art, there isn't enough data for it to learn on. But the sort of second grade um, uh, sort of uh, artwork, the, the kind of uh, Muzak for uh, corporate videos or um, computer games, although actually that's getting quite sophisticated computer. Yeah games uh, I mean the real good composition happening there but but as you com computer games are an interesting example because what you want when you're playing a computer game is that the music will respond to what you individually do and each of us play a game in a very different way I might choose to go one way or stay longer and um, uh, for a human to be able to write that amount of music which is uh, reacting to each individual person is impossible. But an AI can respond on the fly to the things that you're doing and create the music to, to, to be in tune kind of uh, literally with with how you're playing and that would only yeah, that's only possible with with uh, the I mean it's a bit like the uh, journalism for your fantasy football league you, you you can't expect we don't have enough humans to be able to do that but an AI is perfect for it to be able to make, make bespoke music for every single person's experience I tell you one thing you see as a writer I have to write one book which works on hopefully millions of minds if I sell enough copies. But And that's quite a challenge because all of you have different levels of ability. You've all got some people who will know what um, an algorithm is. Some will never have heard of an algorithm before. And I've got to write one book which works on every single person's mind. I think there's an exciting future where we will have AI working alongside an author and that the AI will, it will know the books that you've read know what kind of level you're at and know the mathematical ability that you're at and we'll be able to write a bespoke book together which will be just right for where you are and and somebody else will get a different uh, book experience with the AI and me as author um, according to what their background is. 
I think doctors will be enhanced by AI. I think that, um, <laughs> you see, well, AI um, is able to read the the medical journals in, in you know, and, and take all the data in a way that no doctor can expect to, to see all the advances that are happening over the years. So, um, but it's the combination. We've already seen that, um, for example, radiology scans, um, and AI is picking up things because of the patterns in there which a radiologist is missing. But the radiologist is also doing, seeing things that the AI is missing. And we already have seen that AI and human together is better at identifying cancer in, uh, in scans than each one individually. And that's my message going forward. We should work together. And uh, uh, we have the point, you see, Turing came up with this idea of artificial intelligence. He wanted to try and make a computer that replicated human intelligence. He wanted to use it to try and understand what intelligence was. But actually, I translate AI not as artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence or alternative. The exciting thing is AI intelligence is very different from human. And that's great, because we want something new. We know how to create our intelligence. We, we, do it, we don't do it in the lab, we do it in the bedroom and have kids. You know, and then we get a new little intelligence comes out. Uh, um, so, so the exciting thing for me is we have this prospect of uh, an enrichment of our experience, and 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 think doctors will really benefit going forward from that combination. In, in this um, game of Go, for example, there was a moment when the uh, the algorithm made a move that everyone thought that was a huge mistake, and. Um, uh, it went on to prove at the end of the game that this move was very powerful and won it the game. But now change that into a medical situation. It's not a game, a game's a nice, safe place. Now the AI is suggesting a medical move, which everyone's going, but that's really dangerous. Why are you, why are you suggesting taking that drug? We've never thought of. Um, so the question is, how do we tell whether this is genuinely a mistake by the AI or an incredibly inspired move that's going to, to actually save the patient? We need to, to try and get AI to try and explain why it's making certain suggestions. And that's quite a challenge because you know a lot of it's very deep coding and it's you're asking the AI to somehow project a very high dimensional space into a, a, a much smaller space that we can sort of understand this is the power of language of course you know we have hugely complex things going on in our heads and we have this kind of very low dimensional thing called language which tries to express to you the tries emotional to rationalize it, it yeah it I mean, I'm trying to explain to you know that I'm in love and I have a few words but you know it's hugely complex chemical electrical thing going on and and that's what I think the the challenge is AI is almost like there's so much going on subconsciously in a code that you, we have to find some ways to to ask it well why are you suggesting making that move can you articulate why that's a good move or why are you suggesting that particular medical medical intervention what is uh, and sometimes it's very you know intuition the point about intuition is very hard to put into words and rationalize it, but it's a sort of feeling that we have. I've got an intuition that this might work, you know, just bear with me. Um, that's sort of, in, in a way, we're seeing the intuition of AI and we're finding it very difficult to, yeah, but do I want to just trust that? Um, the more times it gets it right, of course, we will trust it. But I think there are two really interesting issues here. The first is um, who owns the data? Because, you know, for example, uh, DeepMind in London, who developed this uh, Go program, uh, they went on then, you know, uh, the same with, uh, uh, with IBM. They developed a computer to play Jeopardy and then sh shifted over from games to health. The same happened in London. Um, and they got access to the whole of the NHS database. Now, but that's a huge, you know, data is the new oil is the kind of... Uh, common thing you hear. Yeah, d data is very valuable and, and we individually give our data away w w freely, yet it's being exploited by companies. So so I think there's an issue about who ac has access to this medical data, who owns it, who's who's being paid for it, where, you know, should we have a data commons? So should I contribute my data for some sort of kickback. The other interesting thing is, of course, going forward is bespoke medicine. Um, uh, we, we realize that not everyone is the same. And so we will have medicine which is particular to your body or particular to somebody else's. And that, I think, is where AI could be very powerful to be able to, to take your particular data and understand, oh, no, you are going to need this. Uh, and that, that is going to be the big innovation, I think, in, in health. Marcus de Sotoy, thank you so much for speaking with us.